Hi, everybody. I'm Erin Alvarez. Um, hopefully, Stacy's introduced you and explained why I can't be there, but I am very sorry I can't be there in person. However, thank you for technology, because now I can be with you virtually. Um, I am currently a plant science lecturer at the University of Florida, but before I worked here, I, I worked with Kathy and Stacy at Sarasota County, and we really enjoyed putting together this program. The integrated pest management plan for the gardens made a, a big difference for a lot of gardeners, and the community gardening program grew a lot under Stacy's um, guidance and it was great and very exciting for me to see how much it changed from when I first got to the county um, up until just the day I left when she was still putting on programs and educating gardeners. So my part in this was to help um, put together the integrated pest management plan and also do the educational piece to the gardeners and garden managers on IPM. Um, I did that in conjunction with our other staff in the office um, and some master gardeners but um, I'm here today to show you the part that I would show and we would show together to the garden managers and the gardeners themselves to try to not only introduce and explain IPM and how they can use it, but also to educate them and give them the tools they need to help themselves when they're out in the garden and we can't be there. So without further ado, um, I apologize for the quality, but we had uh, had a little bit of challenge with the technology. Hopefully you can see all right. And Stacy has copies of the PDF and the PowerPoint in case anyone wants it. I'm happy to share um, this content for you. So you can see here it's titled Good Bug, Good, Good Bug, Bad Bug excuse me, pest in community gardens. And we use the photos up here to illustrate a really important part about IPM. Hopefully some of you recognize at least one of the insects in these photos, right? This guy should be pretty familiar to most people. This is a mealybug. And I use these two photos to illustrate how critical it is to not only do scouting, but also identification. Because if you see both of these in your garden, do you necessarily have a problem? Somebody tell Stacy or Kathy if you want to participate. Not necessarily, right? Because this is actually a beneficial insect. This is a mealybug destroyer. So it's a larval form of an insect, but it is it does exist in the garden and it does a pretty good job of eating not only aphids, which you'll see the little dark things in the photo here, but also mealybugs themselves. So a little bit of knowledge and identification can mean the difference between seeing this, going out and buying a bug spray or something, um, investing the time and the resources and treating what you think is a problem, but what really might be an insect that's helping you solve a problem without much intervention on your part. We talk about what is a pest, and this is really important because a lot of people assume when they hear pest, they think insects, right? But most of us know that it also includes diseases, both bacterial and fungal um, viral diseases. Weeds are pests, and people don't always think about that. There's a huge argument that goes on when people call herbicides pesticides. Well, technically an herbicide is a pesticide because a weed is a type of pest. Um, we also have animals. That's a huge nuisance for a lot of us. Moles, voles, um, you know, raccoons, all kinds of things, foxes, and then sometimes other gardeners can be pests. And our IPM plan doesn't address the other gardeners. Um, hopefully, I, uh, you've noticed I make poor attempts at humor to try to lighten the subject matter. One challenge we had in implementing this, as Stacy probably already shared with you or Kathy, was the resistance some folks had to organic gardening in general and also an integrated pest management plan. Um, a lot of people were used to doing their own thing, they kind of went rogue, they didn't really look for guidance, they just did what they wanted to do, which is fine. But as many of you will know, it's difficult to implement an IPM plan using beneficial insects and natural products when the person next to you is using pesticides and synthetics. It just doesn't work. You have to create a little system. So we, would, instead of telling people, you have to garden organically, we would do these presentations to try to show them how integrated pest management and organic gardening really will help them in the long run. All we're talking about doing, rather than saying what they aren't allowed to do, we're trying to give them the tools they need to be better gardeners. And as most gardeners with experience know, no matter whether you're a conventional gardener, uh, organic gardener, a mix between the two, if you use biodynamics, the inherent principles of creating a healthy plant and a healthy garden are the same. And it can't hurt to build your soil. And as I'm blocking this adorable baby with an apple, um, I'll show you the rest of the slide. So what we would try to convey was that organic gardening, rather than saying you can only buy your plants at the organic garden store, what you're trying to focus on is building the plant system. So improving plant health, um, creating a production environment for your plants. Give your plants good soil, good nutrition, rather than giving them a dose of vitamins. And I used to use the analogy because a lot of people um, have a hard time understanding the difference between 
providing your plants adequate nutrition and putting on an amendment or a fertilizer, right? So I used to tell folks, fertilizer is like a vitamin. When you have a deficiency or a problem, you take a vitamin and you're better, right? But we can't get all of our nutrition from vitamins. We can't go every day of our lives and only exist on vitamins. Most folks could get that. When I would connect that to plants, they understood that. And I think that shifts a lot of people's thinking in gardening of, okay, I have to use fertilizer. It, it is important to my plant's nutrition, but more important than the fertilizer is the nutrients in that fertilizer. And those nutrients can be gained by improving the soil and using other amendments. So that was a huge part of our educational program was looking at the soil and the system versus treating the plant with uh, spot treatment. Of course, since it's organic, we couldn't allow any synthetic commercial fertilizers unless they were OMRI or ATRA approved um, or pesticides. And this was a sticking point for a lot of people, but with a lot of education, some hand-holding, uh, lots of sympathetic ears on Stacy's part, I think everybody was okay with it at the end of the day. Because really, it's about food safety. It's about putting an apple or a tomato or a pepper in your mouth that you feel comfortable eating. And in Florida, a key part to gardening successfully is timing. We talk about right plant, right place, and then we add right time. This is critical anywhere. But in Florida, we had the challenge with our clientele in Sarasota County. A lot of folks were from up north, so they'd come down from Ohio, Michigan, you know, everything's up north to Florida, but really up north, you know, we, get, we call them affectionately the snowbirds, we love them. But they would come down and garden the way they gardened at home. And as experienced gardeners know, especially if you've had to move to a new place, that doesn't work. You've got to learn the system in the new spot. And for most of our gardeners, it was all about the timing. They'd expect to put their tomato plants in when they put them in at home, which would be May or June. Well, in Florida, that's when we're taking our tomatoes out because they're not going to make it through the summer rains and heat. So getting that timing across and, and showing people how important that step could be to their success, even if they did nothing else, was a huge, huge educational tool. So sometimes instead of rules and policies related to how people can garden, it's back to the nuts and bolts of what's good gardening practice. The tools we told them that they had um, applied to everyone. So instead of the gardeners feeling like they were being singled out or being required to do something no one else had to do, we reiterated that the entire county was going to this policy. So garden staff, garden managers, master gardeners, county staff, county employees had to use these principles that we implemented. Because the community gardens were operating organically, they were all independent, we had to come up with this cohesive plan that united all of them. And that was the integrated pest management plan. As Stacy probably already told you, luckily the county was implementing, um, requiring each division to have their own integrated pest management plan, which was fantastic. And it also helped us get the county staff on board when we had to say things like, guys, you can't come and just spray, you know, rodeo all over everything around the outside perimeter of the garden. It might affect people's plants inside. Well, they started finally figuring that out because fortunately their hands were a little bit forced. They had to. And our gardeners did, I think, like hearing that it wasn't just them, that everyone was using these policies that we created. Integrated pest management sounds really technical. Um, a lot of people don't, they get hung up on the title and the terminology and the vocab, but I would try to tell folks it's just basic common sense when it comes to gardening. And if you tend to be a little bit efficient or frugal like I am, um, it almost comes naturally because you're trying to minimize what you're putting in for what you're getting out, which is food, right? So it's a step-by-step -step process. Um, they don't have to go in order. We'll talk about that more in a minute. It's systems based, right? So at the beginning, I told you we were trying to get people to think about these gardens as systems rather than just an individual person or plant. So we're taking a holistic look. We're looking at the soil. We're looking at the plant. We're looking at the species, the time, uh, what you're doing to the plant, not just, okay, that's a bug. Here's what you put on it to kill the bug. I like to tell folks we used an approach more like a rapier, a fencing tool, um, a very fine point, rather than napalming and treating a problem broad spectrum. So why do we want or need this targeted treatment? Why is it so important? Well, most of our insects, ooh, the lighting just changed, hi again. Most of our insects aren't pests, right? So a lot of people, especially if they're not familiar or comfortable with the natural world, or even if they are sometimes, would see a bug and go, oh, I gotta go get the spray. Well, no, what's that bug doing? Most insects aren't pests. They're not gonna hurt our plants. And this was something we really tried to get across to people. And it's all about that tolerance. How much are people willing to deal with? For some gardeners, one aphid is one aphid too many. They're gonna have a hard row to hoe, no pun intended, with that level of tolerance. 
So think about what the purpose is of the garden. It's to get food, right? We would try to refocus people on that. This isn't an ornamental rose garden. It doesn't matter how pretty your tomato is. All that matters is how it tastes and if it's fulfilling your needs out of the garden. Whether it's stress relief, whether it's to get fresh food for your family, whether it's to get your hands dirty a couple times a week, whatever it is, that expectation and the function of your garden is going to set that tolerance level. So how much pest presence is too much? For me, I have a very high, high tolerance, high tolerance for pests. I'm okay if my plants are a little chewed, if things are a little deficient, as long as I know I can fix it and it's not going to overtake the plant. So part of knowing your tolerance and dealing with it is scouting. And again, this terminology would throw people off. Erin, how do I scout? Do I need a scouting kit? I saw this IPM scouting kit for sale. And I try to keep it really low tech because I don't want the terminology and the process to be an obstacle to people. So scouting, I would use the analogy my great grandmother had. When she would go out and garden, she'd call it puttering. She would just walk around and I do this too now with usually an adult beverage or a coffee, but she would just go out with her little pruners and just putter. She would just kind of look around, check things out. It seemed like she wasn't doing much. And if you ask my husband, I'm not doing much, but really what you're doing is looking, you're monitoring, you're taking note of things. Who's done this? I think, I hope a few hands have gone up, right? We do this. We go out and we look at our plants. Oh, that guy needs more water. Or, oh, he's really not doing so well since I moved him or her. But scout, just see what's going on in the garden. So once you see that something is going on, identify it, try to figure out what it is. So, oh, my leaves look a little different today. Why? What is it that's going on? And this is where we wanted to provide the most support possible. So we would help with resources. I'll show you some of that at the end. But for a lot of gardeners, this was either the scariest part or the hardest part. I don't know. <laughs> Usually it was just scary and it wasn't really that difficult. Um, but once you pointed people in the right direction for resources, not the staff at the big box store, sorry, there's some fantastic people, but most people aren't necessarily good resources for your area. You know, go to reputable resources, like that smart person at the garden center who you know knows their stuff, or um, your extension office, hello, or um, research-based information. Blogs can be fantastic, sharing information with other gardeners are great, but we would try to tell people where to go to get that ID information so that they knew they had accurate information. And then the IPM steps, again, would throw people off. Aaron, I can't remember what order, and what's the name for the one that you use your hands? Doesn't matter, guys. I'm just going to talk about what you do for each step. You can use them in order. I like to use present them in order because it implies a hierarchy of importance, and I'll tell you why in a second. But really, whatever you call these, the procedure is the same. So first, I like to start with cultural because to me, basic good gardening is good gardening no matter what. And this is all cultural IPM is. It's making the bed for your garden, setting a good foundation for your plants. So you wanna build healthy soil, no matter what it is that you have, whether it's clay, sand, silt, loam, uh, a peat, soilless mix from your, uh, your garden center because you're gonna contain your garden. You have gotta add stuff that's gonna make it healthy. You want microbes, you want earthworms, you want compost, right? So build healthy soil. Most gardeners would look at me like I was crazy. Erin, why don't I just go buy the bags of topsoil from the garden center, dump them in my bed and put my plants in? Well, do you know what kind of nutrition is in that soil? What are your plants gonna need? So know your soil. There's more to it than just fill the bed. Start with healthy plants. Pull the plants out of the pot. I would tell gardeners this. A lot of them wouldn't think they can check the roots on plants when they buy them from the garden center. Um, and then look at the variety. Make sure you're buying resistant plants if you have to, because not every tomato is the same, right? Some are powdery mildew resistant, some are verticillium wilt resistant. So start with resistant plants if you know that there's something they're susceptible to. Get ahead of the game by just buying one that's less susceptible. And then hygiene. How many of us have dirty pruners? My pruners are so dirty, but before I go prune my vegetables, I clean them, right? Or my plants, I, prune, I clean them. Making sure you remove diseased tissue and plants. A lot of us, without thinking, will pick a yellow leaf off and just drop it because we know it's going to make mulch or compost. But if it's diseased, what do we want to do? We want to remove it. Same goes for plants. If you know a plant is on its way out, don't leave it there to fix nitrogen or commune with its friends. Take it out, cut, rogue it, or pull it out, get rid of it so that it doesn't infect the other ones. And then depending on where you are, um, in Florida, we always recommend mulch. Some places don't need or use mulch. We like it because it regulates temperature, moisture, and helps with that pathogen load. It keeps the pathogens in the soil as opposed to up on the plant leaves. And irrigation, gosh. If I had a nickel for every irrigation, every plant problem I solved that was really irrigation related, um, I could have flown out to see you on my own dime today. <laughs> but irrigation really solves a lot of problems. So again, this, a lot of this is not plant related. It's the stuff that helps the plants and getting gardeners to think about that is good for them as gardeners and also good for IPM. 
Our gardeners loved lists. When we told people, it's okay as long as it's organic, they didn't want to hear that. So here's lists. Um, I strongly recommend, no matter what your list is, that you provide your gardeners with something. Mechanical, same goes, right? These are your two most important tools in the garden, whether you're picking up a hand tool or just using your hands. And again, a lot of people, oh, the light bulb would go on when you'd say that. Um, a strong spray of water does wonders for getting rid of things like weak aphids or um, you know beetles, things like that on your plant. Traps and baits, everybody's favorite, slug bait, right? Beer, but also pheromone traps, other types of bait and trap. Pruning material out of a plant can be helpful, you know, going through the whole process. We also had to explain soil solarization because people really liked the idea of solarizing their soil and creating what they thought was a clean slate when they came back to garden in the next season. Um, but this is really an alternative to soil fumigation. So if you have a really nasty pathogen that there's no solution for, you might do this, but realize you're going to have to re-inoculate or rebuild your soil with all those good microbes because solarization will kill everything in that top six inches. Biological really does interface quite a bit with chemical, um, but we did uh, address it to show people the role of beneficial insects. So what's this? Right. When I would show this, I hopefully you guys can see it, it's green lacewing eggs. But a lot of people would think this was a fungus. Looks kind of like mushrooms, I can get that. So explaining what beneficial insects are, how they relate to an integrated pest management plan, things like companion or trap plants can be really effective and very important. If you're not adjacent to a wildlife habitat, try to create one because they're going to help you as well. Chemical we'd use as the last resort. So we'd say, are you sure? you want to use a chemical? Did you give the other steps a chance? Did you let the beneficials have a chance to work? Uh, I don't have time to tell you this story, but this is an, a citrus fruit that our previous county entomologist had in his backyard, and it's hard to see, but it's covered in aphids, that's these yellow things, and white mealy bugs. Where most of us would have pulled the orange off the tree or sprayed it, he went away for a couple days, came back, and the beneficial insects had moved in, the orange was pristine. He, it took care of it, he ate it. Um, so again, we don't always need to intervene. Sometimes the system will take care of itself if you set the stage properly. And most importantly with chemical, know the pest so that you know the appropriate treatment and always read and follow the label. As our gardeners had to be reminded, just because it's labeled organic doesn't mean that you don't have to follow precautions to protect yourself or other people or other organisms. So it's still a chemical, it's still a pesticide, still read and follow the label. Again, our gardeners like lists. So Stacy has examples, hopefully for you guys to see, if not, they're online. Um, but that's gonna differ based on your own garden. But whatever you do, people tended in our experience to like those resources. These are those organic materials databases, they're public. Um, these are the resources we would give people that were relevant to our area. Most of these came from Extension. So I hope that you have that resource where you live. If not, there's plenty of resources out there um, from adja adjacent states that would probably apply to where you are. We'd always leave people with contact information, happy gardening, um, keep it positive. Again, we got a lot more people on board by trying to explain how we were helping them have better gardens rather than giving them a you can't do this, you can't do that list. And I hope that I've been able to convey that. I'm over time, Stacy probably isn't surprised. Thank you guys so much for your time and patience and um, I hope you have a fantastic rest of the conference. And remember, let the insects do the work, whether it's entertaining you by beheading grasshoppers or getting rid of your pests. Thanks, guys.